Hello and welcome to the Diane Rehm Book Club. I'm Lynn Kronberger, the Chief Development Officer here at WAMU. We are so thrilled you could join us as Diane and her panel talk about this month's selection, Lucky Boy. As many of you are spending time at home and continue to spend time at home, uh, we at WAMU want to continue to produce these events like the Diane Rehm Book Club to connect you. As a public member organization, our mission is to connect listeners and members with each other and around the world. And we hope events like this do just that for you. As you likely know, the backbone of support for public media and WMU comes from the public. Support from listeners and members is our most reliable and important source of funding. Public radio works because listeners who value the service step up and give back. If you have been enjoying these monthly virtual book clubs, please consider making a gift. You can donate at dianereem.org slash give. We are so grateful for over 730 people who have registered to join us today. This event is being recorded and streamed on Facebook and closed captioning is available. Just click the button on your screen at the bottom. And now let's start the discussion with the host of our book club, Diane Reem. Thank you, Lynn. Good to be with you. And welcome to all of you to the August meeting of my virtual book club. Today, as you heard Lynn say, we'll discuss Lucky Boy by Shanti Sekran. It's a novel that explores race and class immigration, and ask the question, what does it mean to offer your child a better life? Joining me today, Arthi Shahani. She's an NPR contributor and author of the memoir, Here We Are, American Dreams, American Nightmares. Lupita Aquino. She's a columnist at the Washington Independent Review of Books and owner of the Instagram book blog, Lupita Reads. And Christopher Castellani, author of four novels, including his latest, Leading Men. We'll be taking your questions throughout the hour. You can type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Other folks have already submitted questions, so we'll try to get to as many as we can. And welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us. Arthi, let me start with you and with all of you with a very general question. How did you like the book? I'll say in a nutshell, I loved it. I thought it was beautiful and playful and fluid with its prose. And there were certain points that made me so angry. Um, there are certain characters or a character in particular that I dislike so intensely that I found myself pulled in deeper and deeper, wanting to scrutinize it, like scrutinize her more and more. So I have a love-hate relationship with the characters, but a deep love of the book. And Peter, you're nodding your head. Did you feel somewhat the same way? Yeah, I felt exactly the same way. I, I definitely had a love-hate relationship with this book. Um, <laughs> definitely, <laughs> it's a great description. Chris? How about you? I I did not have a love-hate relationship with the characters, I think as strongly as my co-panelists did. Um, I did find the book incredibly immersive. Um, it was, I hate, I hate the cliche, you know, I couldn't put it down, but I did find myself in in these pockets of time wanting to get back to it to see to see what was going to happen. Um, I found it really immersive and propulsive um, just on the pure storytelling level. Um, I was certainly compelled by one 
narrator more than the other. Um, and I, maybe that is probably what we're going to get into. Um, but I didn't have as much of a love-hate relationship with the characters as it sounds like my co-panelists did. I have to add my own voice to this. I truly love this book and felt perhaps uh, unlike many of you that I got a better understanding of the, the courage it takes to make that journey for the character in the book solely who makes that journey illegally to the United States. Um, it was harrowing. And at times, since I tend to read before I go to sleep at night, I just had to put it down because I got so worried about her. So in the opening chapter at the wedding, we get kind of a very interesting focus on Kavya and her family. What did you think of that, Lupita, and how it set up Kavya with her family? I thought it was an interesting uh, thing to start there. Um, and I think it, it really gave us a good introduction to the pressures that she, as a woman, um, was facing in her community with um, motherhood and marriage and, you know, just having a job and having it all, right? Having this this dream of what it means to be successful. I thought it was a really great introduction into her tight-knit community, which is what I really enjoyed. And the expectations mm -hmm. of her, Chris. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it I think it did a great job of putting us in in her world the the and seeing the the pressures as you know as Lupita was saying that are on her. Um, and I forget it, I think it's the hero's journey, right? Where you're supposed to start a book where you see the character in their natural element and you really get a sense of all of the, um, all the dynamics that, that they're dealing with. And whereas with the other character, you know, we, we, know, we saw Soli, you know, back in her hometown, but her, her story has such forward momentum from the beginning. She almost just never looks back. Whereas, whereas we see Kavya, um, right away, just continually looking inward and around this sort of more circumscribed life. Um, and so it was an interesting contrast. Uh, interesting, Arthi, especially that she wears black to the wedding. And immediately her mother comes up to her and says, why did you wear black? Why didn't you wear yeah. one of your bright saris? Yeah. So you get the impression right away her mother is right on top I of mean, you. I get the impression she has a standard Indian mother. That's mm -hmm. like my impression. Mm -hmm. So I don't read the opening, that, that for her family opening scene, what I read into it is, oh, she comes from an upper middle class well-to-do now Indian American household where her parents, you know, do the typical kind of naggy expectation stuff, especially through her mom. It didn't, it struck me as, as very normal, as very kind of like, oh, that's the experience of a lot of Desi women. Um, and I would say, and you know, in part it's, you know, as I read this book, I, I have like a different background myself, right? Like I, I grew up in a working class Indian household, not a well-to-do one. So I definitely felt the amounts of like decadence and privilege and that that to me was just so apparent and Kavya grew up comfortable. Uh, I'm jumping ahead here. My sense of her, her character development is she didn't face many real challenges mm. in contrast to the other heroine who we read about, who, you know, solely is, uh, she's a heroine in, in a deep sense. And so what you get from Kavya is, oh, this is kind of, these are the things she grew up with. It's very, uh, more mundane stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, the stakes are much higher. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Didn't I was mean just that. gonna, no, no, no. I was gonna say just real quickly that the stakes are 
so much lower in a way for Kavya than they are for Soli. I mean, that's that's just that's right. apparent from the beginning. Excuse me, Diane. Right. Yeah. And it's funny because no one wants to say that the stakes of having a child and starting a family are low. I mean, these sure. are like the most deeply or among the most deeply universally desired things. And I've had no shortage of girlfriends who have struggled through issues of fertility, sure. conceiving. So I don't mean to diminish that. Right. But, you know, it, it's happening in the context of privilege. Yeah. 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 And that privilege is the sense that Kavya not only wants a child, she must have a child. And really, um, both she and her husband, Rishi, have been tested and both seem fine, but she's had a miscarriage or two. And finally, they decide to adopt. And of course, this is where the book turns to Soli Lupita, who has really the most harrowing journey coming from South America to the United States. Talk about Soli and Lupita. You had a short passage you wanted to read for us about why she left the uh, for the United States. Will you read that for us? Yeah, of course I, I did. Um, so I wanted to share this question because I think it kind of, it doesn't really give us an answer, but it kind of gives us insight into who Soli is and why she might have decided that this was what she needed to do for herself. Um, and so it's on page 18, chapter two. Um, when Arnold did return, no longer a boy, married now to a woman from Veracruz, he came back with creases around his eyes and dollars tumbling from his pockets and built his mother a home. Soli didn't want Arnold anymore. She wanted a life that moved. And, and what <laughs> did that passage mean to you? I, you know, to me, she just, she was somebody that outgrew her town, uh, outgrew her settings, her environment that knew that in, in her being, there was something more that she needed to be doing and needed to give to the world other than just, you know, being there for her parents and building them a home. Although that was one of the reasons that she decided to, um, you know, come to the United States. But ultimately, I loved that the author wrote that line in because it was subtle, but you know that this was for her. The decision was for her. Describe that town for us. Papacoco is now, is that how it's pronounced? Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, but I'm not very super familiar with Mexico, so I don't even really know if that's like a fictional town or a real town, but yeah. I, if it's a small town like in any other place than Mexico, it's a small town. There's, everybody knows everybody, you know, the people you married, people that you grow up knowing, and I mean, it, it could be fun, but it could also be exhausting, and I mean, it, it doesn't have to be an escape from something like poverty sometimes for, for why people come here, you know, it, it could just literally be, you know, they want growth and they want to be able to step into who they know they could be, which is something that a small town like that can't provide. I'd love to just sort of jump in and part of what Lupita, of what Lupita is saying is, you know, and that passage that you just read, what I appreciate about Soli's character is it's pointing out that, you know, migration is actually the boldest act of one's life. Okay. So yes, in the eyes in of- In many forms, in many forms, Arthi, not just the literal immigration or migration, moving from one life to another yeah. or moving exactly. from one country to yeah. another. Or even if you're within the same country, frankly, I mean, like yeah. to, to decide to pick up and change things, to rip yourself apart from your community because you have some notion of what's possible. Mm -hmm. This is bold. This is heroic. And, it, you know, we see in her, and what I love about the description of her and the character of her is it captures so much of what, politics and policy does not mm -hmm. you know like unfortunately in the non-fictional world of for example news media 
we talk about you know being undocumented or illegal and the conversation is so entrenched in what are the current legal categories you forget the human reality and i think that we see in solely like oh man she is bold mm -hmm. she is tiny and fierce and and hardening we watch her also hardening over that journey chris absolutely i mean this is this is why we read novels right this is what fiction does for us, right? It puts a human face, um, a human soul um, on not just, you know, the people in the news, but our neighbors, um, people who are around us all the time. It, it, it gives them um, an inner life um, that we then think of whenever we see someone who may resemble um, solely on the news. Um, and I think what the book does so well, what I, I felt like I read in a way two different books because the first, let's say, three quarters of this novel really takes its time, and re we, we're in, we're so much in um, every step of Soli's um, initial journey, and we get all these wonderful details and all her inner struggle in a kind of like more patient kind of way, and we really bond with her. At least I certainly did, and I bonded in, on some level with Kavya as well, and then in the later part of the book, which I know we'll talk about, um, it really speeds up and it becomes almost a procedural drama, you know, like a melodrama, you know, in a way that was still pleasurable to read, but was different in its kind of literariness than the first part of it, which yeah. was definitely I, more, yeah, more soulful, I guess. I could say. Can, can you all talk about the journey itself, that harrowing description of how <clears throat> Pardon me, Chico says she has to grab onto mm. the train to get on top of the train. I mean, I, I, I thought, my God, she could die mm -hmm. just trying to get onto that moving train. But in reality, isn't this what many who are making that illegal journey have to do, Chris? I mean, I would, I would imagine it's like this and much, much, much worse in many cases, right? I mean, and again, this is what, this is for me the deepest pleasure of this book was, was following this character um, on, on that journey and seeing the, the choices that she had to make when she you know, changes her clothes in the bathroom and cuts her hair to escape um, detection um, when she's riding on that on you know um, <clears throat> on La Bestia right it's called that 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 train and with with this with this assembly of of men um, and the danger just even that itself posed her and again that as I said earlier that fierce momentum that that fierce forward looking that she has that that is and the courage that she shows every step of the way and that determination um was again just really really compelling um and you you then when she finally does you know get to um california um you you really do feel that she has you know for lack of a better word earned it you know that she has paid so so dearly for for uh for this dream right which is really what it is i must say i wanted to strangle that fellow who promised Mm -hmm. Soli's father, that he was going to drive her in mm -hmm. this big Cadillac mm -hmm. all the way to California. Mm -hmm. And he gave him, her father gave the driver just about every penny he had mm -hmm. to make this happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that happens to a lot of people who are promised safe passage, easy passage, and then she ends up being driven instead to Texas. Isn't that a fascinating piece of, um, you know, frankly, what poor people experience across context? So we have this vivid depiction uh, with, you know, the Cadillac chauffeur who, who is not. And there's a version of him, you know, he kind of looks like you. 
The family wants to trust him. There's a version of him hanging out outside of courthouses all over the U.S., for example, telling you and your family, hey, if you hire me, I'll be able to get you out of X, Y, and Z. Like that person, that sort of predator exists everywhere where there is poverty and dreams. And so isn't it so stark and fascinating that so many millions of people have taken this journey and yet the information, the disinformation, talk about a disinformation mm -hmm. problem, mm -hmm. is such that you don't know when you're giving your life savings. I mean, really, information is power and it's withheld. You know, it, it's, it's a great depiction of it. At the same time, Lupita, uh, dropping her off in Texas allows her to meet the one true love of her life, Chico. Talk about Chico. Um, I found his character to be so short. <laughs> I wish we would have had more time with him. <laughs> and, you know, um, the journey aspect for it, it just, it does, in fiction, I think it always boggles my mind how often, and I think in media too, how often it's such a focus, you know, like, I, what I loved about this book instead was the way that she showed Soli's time in here. You know, and I think sometimes we focus so much on the journey because it's separate from what, you know, what America can do or does to a person, right, once they're here. And the reality is what Soli went through being here in America, you know, being separated from her son, being, you know, kind of preyed upon, uh, even a family member who was somebody she was close to. I mean, I think for me, that part of the book was kind of like, ugh. <laughs> we're here mm -hmm. again, you know, for the millionth time, La Bestia, which is something that I feel like there's so many ways to journey here. And I, to me, that the fact that we, the book focuses on that specific way is interesting. But, but Chico is such an important part because he lives inside her, Chris. Uh, she solely does become pregnant. Uh, by Chico. She trusts him. He has his beautiful voice. He is kind to her. He takes care of her on the journey and tells her what to expect, which is what nobody else does. And really, he, he puts a coat down for her to sleep on. I mean, he is a kind and loving character. Um, and I know that there's a portion, Chris, you wanted to read um, from a passage on page 64, once Soli finally gets to Sylvia's house, Bella. <laughs> Hear that. <laughs> Bella's excited for this passage, yes. Bella's <laughs> excited, what can I say? <laughs> um, yeah, so this is when um, Soli does um, finally arrive, and right, right as she's taking her first shower um, after this journey. Now that she had arrived, her happiness had time to establish its landscape, and it was not pure. Her happiness was terrain, pitted with melancholy. The end of her journey brought with it the realization that Santa Clara Popocalco was behind her, perhaps forever, and that she would never again be the Soli she'd once known so intimately. Um, and I thought, you know, that really captured um, in many ways, you know, the immigrant experience um, of, you know, of, you know, leaving behind not just a country, but a language, um, you know, a family, a life, um, and then being left, you know, being left in this world that is happy, but it is, I, I love that, I love that description of, of happiness as a landscape, but it being pitted, uh, right? Yes. As if almost like landmines, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and I just, I really, this is the sort of literary move that I think um, the author makes so beautifully throughout, but especially in the first, you know, in the first half of, of, of the book. And Sylvia herself becomes one of the landmines. Yes. We thought <laughs> we that think she's an angel, she... <laughs> could trust <laughs> mm -hmm. Sylvia, but mm -hmm. in the end, I mean, it turns out she herself has no papers. She mm -hmm. is not documented. 
uh, once Soli arrives there at Sylvia's home, she thought she'd be safe. She had a social security number which was provided to her. I guess this happens a lot, Arthur, with undocumented aliens. I mean, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, so my family, we came here and we overstayed tourist visas and were undocumented for the first part of our life in America. Wow. And so when you don't have papers, you typically don't ask other people if they have them. Uh, and if you are asked point blank whether you have them, well, sure, I've got some version of a paper or other. And so I don't see Sylvia as a particularly sinister character. I think that Sylvia actually, I mean, when you look at Soli's options, well, where was she going to stay when she landed in America? Right. She didn't have a perfect option, but Sylvia was certainly better than being on her own. Yeah. Um, sure. You know, I think that it, to me, one of the, it, I'm jumping ahead in terms of how we learn these facts, but everyone with us has read the book, presumably, <laughs> so it's okay to do that. You know, there is a point at which Soli is speaking, you know, she's in deportation and she's got a lawyer hired by Mr. Cassidy. And Soli comes to discover that Mr. Cassidy knew she had no papers. And she was astonished by this. Oh my God, he knew it? Talk about gaslighting. <laughs> You're a poor young woman frankly, in a marketplace where you're being hired because, you know, you don't, you know, I don't have to pay you health benefits. I don't have to do X, Y, and Z. So you're what I can afford. I know I'm cutting corners just as you're cutting corners, but if any of us get caught, you're going to pay the price for my cutting corners. So Mr. Cassidy and Mrs. Cassidy hire solely right. as a nurse maid and a maid and to really take care of their children. And um, as Arthi has said, Lupita, he knows because he has asked solely if she has a number. And when he asks that question, Soli's not sure what that means. And it's at that point that Sylvia provides a number. And where does she get the number? How does all this happen in the world of illegal immigration? That's what I'd like to know. Were you wondering about that as well, Lupita? Um. No, I, I don't think I was wondering about it at all. I mean, I think, you know, um, when you're faced with an impossible situation where you don't have a path to any type of hope or citizenship or ability to work in a country, you do what you have to do to provide for your family. And so I felt like it, it's a very, it, it happens. It's something that I think um, I wasn't surprised at it by it at all. I don't know if anybody else was. No, I would no. also know. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, Diane, I don't believe that this, you know, it's important how we define the world in which this is happening. I don't think this is the world of illegal immigration. I think this is the world of America. So we have a country where Mr. Cassidy tells his dutiful worker solely, hey, you're cheaper than a divorce. Right. Mm -hmm. We're hiring you. Mm -hmm. She is a precondition for he and his wife to tolerate staying together. Absolutely. So her illegality is happening in the context of the needs of Americans. Mm -hmm. yes. And so I think that um, what's important to keep in mind is that, and what the book I think successfully does, is it takes this thing that narratively, narratively we've put in the shadows, certainly in newsrooms we've put it in the shadows. And even though it's fiction, it's a novel, it's not supposed to be true, it has accurately depicted how this fits into everyday life. Absolutely. Yes, I mean, I wanted to say, I think, I think the novel has its greatest scorn, beyond scorn for the whole system, the whole immigration system, the greatest scorn for the Cassidys. I feel like the Cassidys are the embodiment of a kind of benign liberalism mm -hmm. where they, or supposedly benign liberalism, where these, you know, this nice white rich family 
um, you know, uh, hires this, um, this maid slash nanny um, um, uh, to help them, but they think they're helping her as well. They think they're supporting her um, and they, but they will only support her until it somehow threatens them um, and until they are implicated. Um, and then, yeah, they provide the, 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 um, the lawyer, but beyond that, they, they completely divorce themselves um, um, from, from Soli. Um, and I found that really, that really compelling. And then in terms of the, the, the system, I mean, there, you know, there have to be these networks of ways that people can survive that we don't know about, I mean, that I don't know about, but that the author, you know, has done her research to sort of find out. And I, and I was really interested in, in that whole, in the way that um, people manage to survive. I was, you know, when she later, the kinds of jobs that she has at the chicken place, like all these, all these details of ways that people survive, I found really specific and compelling. And at this point, we ought to talk about the, quote, lucky boy, Ignacio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and one of our listeners writes in and says, what is lucky about Ignacio? Do you feel that the title is ironic? Is the title true? How did the title fit? in with Ignacio's life. Lupita? Yeah, I, I totally took it as ironic as well. Mm -hmm. I think um, what I did kept thinking though was that he was loved, right? That's what made him lucky. He, he was wanted loved. and he was loved by, clearly by both. Um, and that, that's what I took. Mm -hmm. And you, Arthi? It's interesting. I mean, certainly there's a level of irony in it. Um, it's also, uh, besides being loved, fought over, I mean, I think that this book also really elevates how children are commodities and the desires of adults, you know. Yeah. Um, and I say that about Kavya, not so much about um, Soli. But also, frankly, he's a U.S. citizen. He's born in this country. I think plenty of people back home would say, oh, yeah, there was some drama there. Oh, there was a kidnapping. There, was, there would be relatively small things compared to the upside of what his life chances are that he has the right papers, you know? So I think that there's that kind of level of luck because, you know, uh, your birthplace is a lot of your destiny. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. But... Truly, I think that the idea and the ideal of motherhood is at the heart of the book. Um, there are two women, one of whom wants to succeed at motherhood because her family feels very much that she must be a mother. And so that has been imbued in her. And the other, and, and she cannot get pregnant, so she finally decides to adopt. And then there's this other illegal immigrant who adores that child from the moment she feels her inside of her. Um, so it, it, what do you think about how the author deals with these differences in motherhood? Chris, I'll ask you. <laughs> um, I do think it's one of the central questions of the book, obviously, um, who who is the better, not only what is in the best interest of the child, but you know, who, who is the, which mother in a way deserves the child more. Um, and I think the book tries um, hard to convince us that um, Kavya um, deserves Ignacio as much as Soli does. Um, it, it, it shows that scene where, um, where she goes to potentially adopt another child, but has this in, instant connection um, with Ignacio, and Ignacio has this instant connection with her. And we see first Kavya fall in love with him, and then Rishi fall in love with him. Um, but it takes a little while for Rishi, and it 
and it and because Kavya has gone through this journey um, of her own in terms of IVF and and trying to have um, you know uh, you know um, be, you know pre IVF. Um, it, 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 um, it, you, you really see her kind of working to sort of try to become a mother. And, um, and I don't know how successful that was for me just narratively, because I always felt that, um, that, you know, I never had a question of whom, you know, to whom should Ignacio belong. To me, it was always solely. And, um, and this, even though I was convinced that Rishi and Kavya would be good parents, um, I think the work that the book does to show Soli's determination and to show Soli's love just puts puts her out there as the quote unquote rightful mother, no matter where the kid ends up in the world. I don't know if my co-panelists agree, but I never, I was fighting for Soli the whole time. You know, I was thinking, get out of the way, Kavya, uh, because, you know, um, you know, she is the rightful mother. And not just because I believe in, you know, just pure blood relationships, but, um, but again, because we've so connected with Soli from the beginning. And I, I think there's also that aspect of, of, of violence committed against Soli when her son was taken from him, right? right? Exactly. For an infraction that was nothing, right? Yeah. She became a criminal, essentially. You know, I know we sometimes call it illegal, but I think the correct terminology is undocumented and language really matters here because nobody is legal. Mm -hmm. You know, it's undocumented it's a situation in which you come to a country and don't have papers right it's so but i, I found that interesting because i too was it, i didn't find like it was biology related i thought it was definitely just yeah i couldn't get over the that violent act she was taken from her son so yes. i agree she was yeah, I, taken from her son and put into the most horrible kind of situation arthi yeah, you know, there. it's interesting. And I, I do want to just say one thing about, because I mean, motherhood is it's at the heart of this book, you know, and I feel like, who is a fit mother? Is it the woman with a good and healthy economic, or a, a, a very safe, good economic background, who frankly, shows no grit, shows no <laughs> capacity <laughs> for navigating the real world, mm -hmm. who instantly leans on the people all around her and whines a whole lot? Or is it the poor woman who goes through hell and high water to survive? I mean, like I really thought about who would I want to be my mom? And I can tell you, my mom was a whole lot more like Soli than like Kavya. Mm -hmm. huh. And so I knew who I was rooting for, in part rooted in my identity, but I think that this book was really playing with who is fit. Mm -hmm. And how fat, you know, it's interesting because Chris, you were saying that you thought the Cassidy's were sort of the villains here. Mm -hmm. And it could be because Kavya comes, you know, she's, she's something like my skin color. We're both Indian American, whatnot. Mm -hmm. I was really scrutinizing her, mm -hmm. right? The way that you only do with your own, mm -hmm. okay? And so I found her to be the most um, treacherous of liberal characters mm -hmm. because she was so willing to ignore the context of the birth mother. She had zero curiosity. Oh, why is this child in foster care? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, what's the situation of the woman who gave her? She had no she curiosity. She actively did not want to know. She actively kept it. She kept literally... She was like, well, that has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and meanwhile, her husband, the, a hilarious side story about her husband's clean, clean air project, clean, mm -hmm. clean energy project. To mm -hmm. me, that, that young couple was the epitome of what's horrible about, you know, the sort of privileged liberal class. It's mm -hmm. zero proximity to poverty and zero curiosity about what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, located in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Vivek, who says, to me, the most courageous thing Soli does is to decide to keep the baby, knowing full well it could possibly be a rapist, and also realizing that keeping the baby could cost her big in terms of losing her job and possibly her dream. What do the panelists think? Beautiful point. 
<laughs> Chris? <laughs> um, I'm not sure, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what to make of that, of that question. Um, well, should she perhaps because she was raped by three men after her loving encounter with Chico, mm -hmm. she really had no idea whether the baby was Chico's or perhaps one of the rapists. Mm -hmm. And might she have given up that baby by abortion mm -hmm. or some other means? Um, but in her heart, right. the baby was Chico's. Right. And, and, and she loved him. Mm -hmm. Again, the book asks us, I was wondering that same thing. And I mean, she almost, I mean, she goes, of course, to the abortion clinic to, um, um, you know, to, um, to potentially have this happen. And at the last minute, right, if I remember correctly, she, she decides against it because I think it's because she does feel that it's his. And it's never questioned, right? I mean, the baby's born and she sees the same eyes or, or something. So we're asked to believe it's a little bit of a, I think a bit fanciful on the part of the author here to to ask us to uh, to make that happen in the book um, because um, otherwise that that was an anxiety I had reading the book the whole time thinking are we going to ultimately find out that it's not Chekhov's that and uh, but I think it's against pointing to the like in a way that Soli's kind of charmed status I mean it seems strange to call her charmed but but that her kind of heroism and her determination allows for these magical things to happen um, and, and that she creates in a way um, her own luck out of her own bravery and her own love. Um, and, and I think the, the book kind of wants us to believe that, um, so. Chris, I just want to say to you, your microphone may be hitting oh. something and <laughs> it's, it's making a funny little noise. Okay. That I hear each time you move forward. Oh, no. And I'm, you know, my Italianness makes me do this. So I'm of sorry. Course. It makes me move all over the place. So I can't I not speak with my hands. Totally. <laughs> I'll try okay. to do this from now on. Thank you. It's okay. What about um, Rishi and his love for Kavya? I mean, well, I'm going to back up a little bit because there is a court case and the court case was heartbreaking because Soli was not allowed to participate in the court case in which a judge must decide whether Soli gets her child back or Kavya and Rishi can keep Ignacio. And the judge decides that because Soli never showed up at the hearing and didn't, I quote, even call in. And why did she not call in? because there were 40 or 50 women lined up at the telephone. She could not get to a telephone in the prison she was in. I mean, I was heartbroken for her. And I wondered how realistic a portrayal that might have been of undocumented persons who are in court battles of that kind, Lupita? Um, I, would, I would think that it's pretty spot on, you know. Um, I, I'm, I'm reading right now uh, an advanced review copy of Maria Inutiosa's Once I Was You a memoir, and she talks about what she saw in the detention centers um, and and it's a lot of it is she talks about the rape that goes on and it's a lot it's a reality 
um, it's one that I don't think we discuss or even see in the media enough. You know, I would, I would just add, Diane, as you know, before I became an NPR journalist, I was for a decade of my life uh, an activist working in jails and prisons with immigrants being deported following the 9-11 attacks. Um, and unfortunately or fortunately, seeing firsthand the cases of more than a thousand people. And so something that struck me in Shanti Sekaram's writing of the process is she really elevates some important details about how broken it is, even on the margins, like the fact, the fact that you can be detained in one city and then without notice shipped off somewhere else in the country. Um, that detention is in the eyes of the law, it's actually a civil hold, but you don't have any basic rights. Like technically the detainees should be able to have cell phones with them. Why wouldn't they? But that's not allowed. It's treated like a criminal hold. And so I felt that she did a, a really good job just kind of showing how the, I mean, that's the other villain here, it's bureaucracy. And then the idiocy of different court systems. So because in a federal immigration proceeding, you're held in one place, the state level foster care system is clueless about how that proceeding works. And it's like, oh, mother must not care. It's mm -hmm. this, I mean, we've seen this happen over and over again. It was shocking to me that the judge ruled without any investigation as to why the mother had not in some way appeared. It just was outside her purview. Is that what you're saying? That they just sort of accept the fact that, well, she didn't call, she didn't show, she must not care. Yeah, I mean, it, just as a, as a matter of fact and lived reality, you know, because deportation's a federal system, a whole bunch of things that may play out at the state level are unaware of, unable to gain any knowledge of, and frankly, not interested in. I mean, like, you know, what is a court system in general? A court system is a bureaucracy where no one's trying to maximize for justice. They're trying to ma maximize for caseload. So, you know, now, I thought it was a realistic portrayal. Here's an interesting uh, question from Kathy in Maumee, Ohio. She said, I did not feel I was offered new insight into immigration in this country, but I was offered an emotional experience that led to even more empathy and greater desire to act. I was virtually heartbroken by the end. I experienced such enormous sadness for Soli and Ignacio, Kavya and Rishi, that I felt ultimately hopeless. This, I think, is a good thing. How do you react to that, Chris? I mean, it gets back to what we said earlier about what novels can do, right? It, it brings these, it creates this opportunity up these opportunities for empathy to to live in these characters skins to go through what they go through to think what they think um, and the more stories like this um, not all you know the more stories told um, about these people by these people by people in not just these few people in general um, the more options we have to have empathy for um, you know for again our neighbors um, and um, the people in our family even and so uh, I think I think the, the you know the question just speaks to again to the power um, of you know of literature to sort of slow life down right so that we can live alongside these these characters for a while um, and they don't just flash by on the news they they're they're with us in our house as we as we read them and um, and again for me that was you know no matter what you feel about the characters in the book like the author did a tremendous job of 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 connecting us to these characters in their heads i think so toward the end of the book solely manages with a knife a small knife in her hand to escape from that detention center 
talk about a harrowing journey back to the Cassidy's home and back to her beloved son. What did you think of that part of the story, Arthi? It's interesting because uh, it's the most fanciful. You know, I, I don't believe that, um, I mean, detention centers typically are, uh, it's prison security. So that escape would, would not have been possible. But let's put that aside because I don't care. That's why I'm reading the novel. But don't forget, she was being raped at the time. Well, the rape is very plausible. The escape through a window into a forest, not so much. Exactly. But I would say that, um, you know, that detail aside, and this is, I mean, I love this about, like, I, I don't mind that it's no longer kind of realistic, but now she's, she's got a cape on and she's flying and man, I want her to fly. And man, I want her to kidnap her son back. I want that. I want her to take what is hers Mm -hmm. because we know it's not going to happen in a court system stacked against her. So as a reader, I had that feeling. And you're going back to, I believe, one of the people who commented, maybe his name was Vivek. It would have been easier for her to not seek out Ignacio. As a single woman, it sounds like she's young and pretty she could have had other survival strategies to try to make it in this country. But that as a woman without a home, she sought home in that child. He could have been the child of rape and we never know. And she never knows, but it's hers. And they were at least on that journey together. And so I just feel like to the extent that we see portrayals of true love on the page, that's true love. You know, and I I was so happy about it. How about you, Lupita? No, I, com- I I love that you said that. It was so spot on. I think she, her home or what she was searching for, she found, right? Mm-hmm. And there was no way that anybody was going to stop her. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, she was not going to let that go. And I think that that, that was the beauty of the book um, for me. I completely agree. In an interview, uh, Shanti Sekran says, Immigration is the ultimate story. It encompasses every basic plot type, rags to riches, overcoming the monster, the quest, rebirth, comedy, tragedy, voyage, and return. Migration is a process of transcendence that reaches into so many aspects of our lives. It's not always about passports and visas. Motherhood is a form of migration. So is love and so is death. I thought that was absolutely beautiful. Um, But I wonder what you, Arthi, think about immigration in that sense you know it's as you read that passage and it's no secret that our country is struggling so much with developing policies that reflect our values and needs i mean the breakdown is across the board it's not just in one issue area but i have this little fantasy as you're reading that that beautiful uh uh passage you know just imagine that before our lawmakers reconvene and talk about what immigration reform should look like. Just imagine if we were allowed to give them a signed reading. And that fiction, which is captured so much better than much of nonfiction about the truth of the experience, yeah. be handed to them so that they are forced to look at reality as depicted in, you know, novels. <laughs> like, I just, I feel like the disconnect between the conversation about visas and passports and naturalization versus the lived reality. It's just so enormous. I would love to give, you know, the judiciary committee some assigned reading. Uh, (laughs) Here's when anyone questions the, the, you know, 
the value of humanity is education, you know. <laughs> there is one last quick question from Audrey in Alexandria, Virginia. Why did the author of Lucky Boy not seem to face the kind of outcry of cultural appropriation experienced by Janine Cummins when American Dirt was published in 2019. Lupita. Um, so I can't speak to why exactly she didn't. I can say that um, when this book felt like it was written with care, um, it felt like it was uh, written to explore a character beyond just her undocumented status. And I think that was important for me. Um, so I, I don't know, <laughs> that's a good question. What do you think, Chris? I mean, I think, you know, um, writers should always, um, you know, every writer is allowed to write about whoever they want, right? They can write about anyone else's experience and, um, but they have to do their homework and more importantly, they have to be ready for any kind of criticism of you know, oh, you, I don't think you got this part right. I don't think you got that part right. It seems to me as though in, in this case, she did a lot of really intense research. Oh, and Right. And she talked, she talked, it sounded like she really talked to the right, to, to enough people. And frankly, you know, there, I guess, because there wasn't as much of a, um, um, a, a, a quibble with the details, meaning she means, I guess she got them right, you know? So, I mean, it's almost like if she, if people aren't, aren't criticizing you for getting the details wrong, then you did it right, uh, right enough. And that's why she wasn't criticized. It may be as simple as that. I mean, I think the cultural moment is different than it was a few years ago. Um, maybe people are under different kinds of scrutiny. Um, but, um, but I do think that from what I, from what I've read or not read, it seems as though, you know, she, she, she got the important details right. Artsy. You know, I think that fundamentally, and I, I will admit uh, with American Dirt, I only read, you know, maybe the first chapter of it. Um, I mean, by way of quality of writing, this is hands down just a far more masterfully written book. You know, I don't think that that's a controversial statement. I think that people who have read the both or even just read American Dirt are not particularly impressed by the prose, the quality of that themselves. So, you know, much of the American Dirt backlash, as I understand it, has to do with here was a book with an enormous marketing machine around it that maybe wasn't quality, but was getting marketing and people didn't appreciate that kind of, you know, um, unfair privilege given to it. But I think fundamentally, you know, coming back to Lucky Boy, I don't view it as a book about um, the immigration experience so much as about motherhood. When I think about who am I gifting this book to, who are the copies I'm gonna send off to my friends, it's gonna be every girlfriend of mine who is thinking about or has become a mom or is thinking about that journey because you have two very different young aspiring mothers. Their yeah. motivations are different. Their grit is different. How they express love is different. And I think it gives so much food for thought about whether, you know, what kind of mom are you? And that is a perfect note on which to end our discussion. I want to thank you all so much, Arthi Shahani, Lupita Aquino, and Christopher Castellani for being with us. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of our listeners and viewers for joining our discussion. Before you go, I would ask you to please take a minute to fill out a short survey um, about this event. It'll pop up on your screen. It'll only be there for about 10 minutes and fill that out for us. And also, if you would consider donating to WAMU, your financial support is what makes it possible for us to bring you events like this. Our next meeting at the book club will be Wednesday, 
September 30th, we'll be reading The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. Stay tuned to your email for more details. Again, my thanks. Thanks to all of you. I'll see you next time.